Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 153, Game Times at Ridgemont High. Games a teen can toss in their backpack and bring to school. I'm here and so is the Tabletop Bellhop himself. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. This episode is sponsored by Crowd Games. After you're done watching the show, why not check out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter? This is a one verse many hidden movement game with a very cool steampunk theme and fantastic production quality. So this week, I've got a question from my biggest fan, my daughter, who's looking for games she can toss into her backpack and bring with her to high school. After that, we kind of messed up here because these two things shouldn't be going together. We've got a review from the opposite end of the spectrum as we look at the Veil Dancer Hero set, which is an 18 plus not safe for work adventure for the Adventuria advent Adventure card game. So I don't know, uh, Deanna pointed out the irony there. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I remember we were trying to get our, our, our reviews to match our content. I kind of gave up on that. And I didn't even think about putting these two things together being a little <laughs> interesting. So <laughs> I do apologize for half of the content not really getting together with the first half of the content. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Well, let's start off with a comment from SW Gamer 80 on our White Star Galaxy Edition review. A tribute order. I don't know that they are the same, but earlier, OD&D, AD&D First Ed, I believe, had the order as Strength, Int, Wiz, Dex, Con, and Charisma. Now, bonus XP, I think this was a thing because OD&D didn't initially have many bonuses for high attributes. So the high strength fighting man was a naturally better fighter than a low strength fighting man because of the XP bonus and not yeah. necessarily represented in bonuses to hit and damage. But this got carried into later editions that did give attribute bonuses. Yeah. Not saying it is great or realistic rule, but that's where it comes from. Well, thanks for that info, SW Gamer. Um, now, I did notice the stat thing myself. Since we published that review, I've actually sat down and read through the basic red box D&D, the, the one that the, the majority of people seem to be their first D&D experience. I finally finished reading it this past month. Um, we're actually making some characters for it on our Discord, with the possibility of me running a game for our patrons sometime in the future. And it does have it in that order. Strength, in Wiz, Dex, Con, Charisma which I wonder when it changed. Cause like in my head, it's always been strength, dex, con, int, whiz, charisma. It's always the strength, int, whiz is just like, no, that's in the wrong order. I need my physical stats and then my three mental stats. They're divided in my head by an invisible line on the character sheet. And I don't know when that actually changed. It was definitely like that by the time, like when I actually got into D&D &D, was AD&D &D second edition. So by that point, that was the firm list. And that's the list every edition I played since has used. But I now get that, well, that's why White Box ha or White Star has it in the other way. Now, as for getting extra XP for high stats, I just don't like it. Like, it, it just bothers me. So in basic D&D, &D, your fighter still gets strength bonus for to it and to damage. You get an intelligence bonus for languages. You get a charisma bonus, which gives you a bonus on morale checks for your hirelings, because in those editions, you had lots of hirelings. So not only are you getting a bonus for the high stat, you're also getting an XP bonus. Now, I am assuming that White Box, which is the original OD&D, came in a white box that was wood, right, with little tiny books, um, didn't have these bonuses, so maybe they didn't. But even if it's true, I don't get it. Why? Why reward characters for having high stats with experience? What I would love to see, and I don't know if this has been done with all the OSR games out there, someone's probably done this. What I think makes way more sense is that you would get more XP for low stats. So if you're the fighter with a six strength and you get minus two to hit, but you managed to survive, you should be rewarded for that. Like you did a great job. You managed to kill a goblin with a six strength. That's awesome. Or if you're the wizard who, you know, has a nine intelligence and only ever gets to memorize one spell for their entire career, and you survive and you get to the end of the dungeon, you should get extra XP for that. 
as opposed to the wizard who knows every spell in the book and gets plus 20 to all the rolls and they kill a dragon you're like yeah so what of course you're maxed out <laughs> i don't know I've, I've never liked it i also didn't like in palladium where you rolled 3d6 for stats but if you rolled 16 or higher you added another d6 i just don't like anything that rewards the people who are already in the lead and maybe that's some social commentary there as well <laughs> all right well next some more love for quacks of quacks of Quedlinburg. Michael Lowry writes, nice review. Would recommend getting the Quacks of Quedlinburg, the Herb Witches, which adds several elements that I always or almost always include when playing. Oh, thanks, Michael. Um, at this point, I think you're preaching to the choir. Everyone, I, I, the most comments I've gotten on our Quack stuff is pick up the expansions, get the expansion. You'll love the expansion. You know what makes this game better? The expansions. I've heard that so many times. They're on my wish list for Christmas. I'm guessing they're probably going to happen because I've been talking them up so much and talking about how excited we are. Plus, everyone in the family likes this game, so it makes a good family gift. So I, my, my bet is it's coming, and if it's not, if I get any gift card money, I know where it's going. All right. Well, now I want to highlight some very positive comments on our last Sunday brunch, which we're doing now over on YouTube Live. Kate Burns says, thanks, guys. I listen to the podcast all the time and caught you as I was doing some work live. Thanks. And Jeff Wood says, great stream today. Well, thanks so much, Kate and Jeff. I am so glad to hear this because Sean and I were actually talking about whether or not we are wasting our time with the brunch episodes. Uh, based on what we could see during the, the, this stream where we got these comments, it looked like we had one person in the chat from the entire stream from start to finish. And I got to say, I, at least I was feeling pretty defeated. Um, so I'm so glad to hear not only were there obviously more people watching than the one we could see because we had multiple people comment, but that they were also enjoying what we were putting out there. Now, both of these names are names I don't recognize from our other live streams or from the blog or anything like that. So I'm thinking Swap to YouTube may have been worth it, even if all we get is two new fans out of this. Well, we're still figuring out some of the differences with YouTube. It's mm -hmm. been a nice experience so far. Remember, you can join us at 1 p.m. for these unscripted brunch episodes, as just mentioned, now on YouTube. <laughs> Now, next, a question from Adam Day, based on our recent plays of Castles of Burgundy. Mo, have you happened to get eyes on the new edition? Just curious if it's just a visual upgrade or if they changed anything. You're kind of my go-to anymore for board games. Wow, Adam, thanks so much for that. That you're kind of my go-to anymore for board games? I want everyone saying that. that. That's our goal, right? We need to have lots of people saying that. Now, I don't own the new edition personally, but I have been tempted to buy it. And I haven't though, because the whole thing is there, it's a deluxe. It's a, it's an anniversary edition and everyone complains about the graphic quality of the original Castles of Burgundy and everyone totally expected a, a blinged out, better, improved, more clear version. And all we really got was a brighter version. It's still drab. It's still kind of, man it's hard to see the different icons and know what they mean and it didn't really improve the game at all graphically so in that case there's no reason to pick up the new game like you you already have it and to be honest i don't think the graphical improvements are worth it but because it was an anniversary edition they put in all the expansions now there was never a big box go buy an expansion for castles of burgundy but they did release a number of these little small expansions and promos that were mostly available through Board Game Geek and cons and as promotional items. Well, they put all that in the new edition, including some really interesting ones, like a new pick up and <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, like a new pick up and deliver system for when you're shipping goods. You can kind of put them all over the place and, and try to fulfill contracts. And then there's new boards, including ones where you have separate islands that are connected by the seaports. And like, there's some really neat stuff in these expansions. But everything I've heard about them is they're all kind of neat, but you don't need them. So that's why I'm totally on the fence. Um, to be honest, it's one I should have put on my wish Christmas wish list because it's not one I'm probably going to go spend on money on myself, but I wouldn't mind having. So as for picking it up yourself, Adam, totally up to you. Just know... If your complaint is hard to read icons and black colors and being able to tell yellow apart from brown, the two greens, sorry, there is no yellow, there's green. If it, in telling two greens apart, it's not fixed with the new edition. 
right, well, finally, we got a bunch of comments on our Emergence of Shy Pluto review from last week. Starting with Jay Behrens, who said, I will play this game anytime, anywhere. And Chris Groff shares the love with, great game for sure. Played it mm -hmm. through two players, up to seven players with the expansion, and it plays well at all counts. Now, Board Game Grand was most amused by the YouTube version and commented, expansion for Dracula Sand Beach. In the, titles, <laughs> in the subtitles, made me LOL. This sounds good, but I don't own Space Base. I like the idea of the story and it building on the cards. Mm -hmm. The slow drip method it sounds like this uses sounds fascinating. Great rundown, guys. And finally, Ryan S. Dancy commented, For the curious, my wife and I played the whole expansion in about three game sessions of perhaps three hours each. You can play Space Base in an hour if you don't dawdle, so that's about nine games. Oh, thanks for all that. Uh, thanks, Jay, Chris, Ryan, and Board Game Grand for those great comments. Expansion for Dracula Sand Beach, I gotta admit, took me a bit. I had to read it, and it's, you know that there's a board game you can buy where you read out these things to try to figure out what the actual sentences are. I can't remember what it's called. It was one of those, and I'm like, oh, I bet you... We were talking about the Wrath expansion for Draconis Invasion. So I think Dracula Sand Beach is Draconis Invasion. And you can check the things down below to see how it did this time. Uh, so we finally figured that one out. I got to say lots of love for Space Base and this expansion. Though I didn't get the comments I want. What I want to know is if you have played Shy Pluto, what do you think about the Miners of Shy Pluto module? That's the thing I'm on the fence about. And I've actually, I now have a final decision, which I'm, I'll, I'll iterate here, but I want to know what other people think of that aspect of it. Everyone's like, yeah, the story is great and it's great. And I have it and I played it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, but do, do you like what the final solution was? And then to follow up from last week, my answer is I have no problem with it leaving it. Because what I discovered is that you can interact with the new thing you can buy the new ships and you can buy the new thing you get with the ship and no spoilers don't worry you can buy the new thing you get with the new ships and use them to do the new random thing or you can just not buy them and just leave them there and there doesn't seem to be any problem with a group of players where some buy and some don't since i don't like the new thing i just want to buy the new thing i buy other stuff and keep playing space space like i always have and it works perfectly fine someone else i'm playing with for example tori Loved the new thing and bought tons of it and did all kinds of things and had some great Yahoo moments with the new thing. That's not for me, but it's perfect for him. The only time this can be a problem is if everyone decides not to engage with it, you might want to house rule a way to wipe the market. But other than that, as long as even one player is buying those cards, you may as well leave it in. There are going to be players out there that will enjoy it. So overall, kind of going back in my review, that's an even bigger thumbs up. I see no reason not to play with it in because there's probably going to be someone at your table that will engage with the mining aspect of the game. All right. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One big announcement before we move on, our roll camera review and giveaway is live. Head over to the blog and read up on our thoughts on this cooperative movie-making board game and enter to win your own copy using the widget at the bottom of the review. Uh, spoiler, we love the game. You're going to want a copy of this one. We're giving away one copy of the retail version of Roll Camera, which does not have the clapper lid or the game trays box insert, but does include everything else we mentioned in the review. We're willing to ship this to one winner located in the continental U.S. or Canada. Now, as usual with our contests, I encourage our patrons to watch their inboxes, suggest signing up for our newsletter and joining us live because we tend to have this habit of dropping bonus entry codes here and there, like the one we're dropping in chat right now. Good luck, everyone. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. So the other day, I'm sitting here, I was in the middle of something, my daughter comes to me and asks, hey dad, do you have any suggestions for games I could bring with me to school? And I'm like, I guess. She's like, the problem is it's got to fit in my backpack. So it has to be games that are small enough to fit. And well, her backpack's huge, but she has a lot of stuff she carts to and from school every day. A uh, big part of that being they're having locker issues at the school due to construction. So she carts a lot of stuff back and forth. 
and she finally now has a locker but she for some reason because she started off carrying all this stuff we can't convince her to leave the stuff at school seems to think she has to bring it all home and bring it all back every day which whatever I, I have teenager issues the thing is she doesn't have a lot of room in this backpack whatsoever so what we're going to be looking for is something that's small enough to fit light enough to not add a lot of weight and fun for younger teens she is currently 14 the kids she's been playing with would be in that you know 14 to 15 range now, I figure most of these games are probably good for younger to older as well. And they may even, most of them probably work for even younger kids to a grade school event. But I definitely stuck to the high school level of gaming. So, of course, I made a chance to help, uh, jumped at the chance to help her out, made a pile of games on our game table downstairs and actually spent four to six hours with them playing through a bunch of the games to teach her so that she could make a educated guess on what or educated uh, opinion on what to bring. Now, unfortunately, today was the day she was supposed to bring the games. And I was really hoping to get uh, what you bring and what was the reaction. And she totally forgot because she was too busy worrying about having to wear a hoodie in five degree weather and, and not dressing warm enough and completely forgot. But bonus, the teacher forgot too. So she's actually doing it tomorrow. So next week, hopefully, I can give you um, an answer to what she brought and how it went. Now, what I was thinking about this whole time I'm doing this is this is be a great topic. Plus, who's better question to answer than my own daughter? So here we are. So today, I am going to be sharing games from my personal collection. So these may or may not be in print. I didn't check. I didn't look at a specific store. I didn't look at a time frame. I didn't stick to new games. I didn't stick to old games. I went down in my basement and I grabbed every game that was probably small enough to fit in her backpack, put them in a, in a, uh, a milk crate, brought them upstairs, threw them on my Calax shelf behind me, and I'll be talking about most of those games. There's some on here I already removed from the list, but we'll be talking about those. Now, normally we make sure our recommendation lists are in no particular order, but tonight we thought it would be useful to sort the games. Mm -hmm. In this case, that sorting is by box size, with the games taking up the least room being listed first. All right, the first game I have on this list is Love Letter. Now, the edition I own doesn't count because it's a nice big box and it's got the Asian theme to it, the Oriental theme. I think it's a Japanese theme. This game, normally you can buy in a little silk baggie and it's 18 cards and some little heart tokens or cubes, depending on the edition you buy. There's nothing more portable. Like she doesn't even have to put this in her backpack. She can put it in her pocket. And yes, we make sure my daughter's clothes has pockets. So she can throw a love letter in her pocket. This is a dead simple game where you play, you have a card in front of me and you have cards in your hand. You're going to play a card in your hand and it's going to manip manipulate what cards are in play. And then the person that has the lowest number of cards wins the round. Win enough rounds, you win the game. And of course, every card you play does stuff like swap cards with another player and peek at what another player's card is or kill another card. Love Letter is one of the most popular micro games out there. Um, I personally think for high school kids, it's going to seem odd, especially if they're, they're used to traditional games. But because there's only 18 cards, actually, there's less than 18 cards to learn because some of them have, there's multiples of some of the cards. I, to be honest, I'm not sure how many different cards there are in Love Letter. But it, once you learn it, it's so simple and you can play many rounds very quickly. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to go wrong with uh, Love Letter. And of course, there are very different, various different themes of Love Letter yes. for uh, all the different folks who might be interested. Next, I have I, I, I picked one. So Love Letter, besides having different themes that all play the same, there are enough variants of love letter there's different little twists on love letter that play differently that aren't quite the same thing so the one i picked that i think teenagers are going to enjoy the most is lucha efe this is a luchador wrestling version of love letter where you're ending up with two cards in play one is your wrestler and the second is who's in your corner as your manager and then there's a whole ranking system for the belts and it even comes with little belts you can put on your fingers because they wrap around just a, a, for a love letter variant, I really dig this version. I think it's a lot of fun. It's got interesting mechanics. And I think the theme is really going to be like, as a teenager, I don't want to play a write a letter to the princess. I want to play some luchadors with, especially the manager aspect that hold not just your wrestler, but who's in your corner, I think is fascinating. Absolutely. And who can go wrong with luchador, luchador wrestling? Next, another card game. I actually think we're going to have mostly card games tonight because, well, cards are portable. 
I have Hanabi. Now, I've mentioned before, I am not a huge fan of this game, but this is one we actually sat down and played with the kids and ended up they loved it. So this is a cooperative card game where the biggest twist is you're going to hold your hand to five cards so you can't see them. The back of the cards face you, the actual front of the cards face the other players. You're then trying to play your cards in order from one to five in, I think it's four different suits, maybe five with the expansion. I forget the exact number. And you're trying to get one to five, but there's very strict communication rules where all you're allowed to tell another player is either about the numbers they have in their hand or the color, but never both at the same time. This, I think, is a, is a can be a great game, but mainly I put it on the list because my kids loved it. Like they, they, we did pretty well. We managed to get two stacks up to five. Now I will admit another one was still at one, but like we did pretty good for the first time they're playing and they really liked the, the whole not seeing your cards and working with other players and giving clues and discarding random cards with that whole, oh, you discarded the four. We needed the four. They really enjoyed it. So I wanted to keep it on the list mainly for their sake, even though it might not be one of my favorite games. You know what? I have to say, I actually really love Hanabi. Now I've never played in person, which is weird, but I think Hanabi has actually played quite well on Board Game Arena because of the limitations. You don't actually have to worry about not being able to talk mm -hmm. because you're in a different city or in a different country or whatever. The only thing you can do is say number or color. Yeah. Um, and so that it, it, you lose some of the, the subtle wincing and things that, that are part of the game, but those are also kind of technically cheating. So yes. it, it's the more pure version of the game on BGA. <laughs> yeah. Everyone who plays Hanabi, every group that plays Hanabi has their own set of, how far they're willing to push the rules. It's just like a, another game we'll mention later has the same thing, but Hanabi definitely has a, uh, these are twos, you know, or or these are threes and the order you tap them in counts and the weather you're like, oh, that's a five, which means throw it away, right? There, there's a lot of social aspects of Hanabi, which to be honest is what I don't like about. I, I probably enjoy it more on board game arena because every time I play it, I'm just like, Oh, thanks for the subtle hint. Like, come on. That's not in the spirit of the game. But then I know people play that way that love it. And because they win more often and they're excited about it and they feel good. So fair enough. Yeah. I have to say I've never won in all the rounds I've played yeah. on BGA. We've never won. <laughs> See, I, I think you might need some of the subtle hints, but yeah, it's that tolerance level. And it's one of those games. If you play with another group, ask, like if you're you sit down at a at a board game night and you start playing hobby, be like, whoa, whoa! Before we start, what are your rules? What do you accept? Because I I have seen games where they're like, this is a one and two. Hey, you can't do that, right? Like, make sure you're all on the same page. All right, my next recommendation: if we were in not going by size, this would be number one. This is honestly the best thing you can give your kids to bring to high school, and that is a pack of playing cards. This is what we had growing up um at least locally euchre was huge in high school people were playing it constantly between classes and in the lunchroom in the library after school at the coffee shops euchre was huge i know other schools where hearts and other card games are popular and poker playing either from for lunch money or just tokens or pencils or whatever uh, you honestly can't beat a deck of playing cards for a variety of games that are out there there are thousands of way to play playing card games um, and honestly, like, except for the fact we're mostly a hobby game podcast, the best thing you do, throw up a deck of cards in your backpack. Though you do necessarily have to talk to them about gambling at school, because that is highly frowned upon these days. Uh, and also, True. I mean, when we were playing, when I was playing at my high school, it was a game that is uh, occasionally known as capitalism, scum or president, but also known by a very Other different names. name that I'm not allowed to pronounce on this podcast. Yes. <laughs> I got the bell here if you do want to say it, but I don't think you have to. Yeah. So uh, there's there's definitely a lot of games out there, uh, some of which are more or less appropriate for mm -hmm. high school. And so as long as the kids are aware of, of you know, where, where the limits should be, it's all good. Next, I managed to throw an RPG on this list, which I did not even think of until I was literally down in my basement looking around at my small box stuff. And I'm like, oh, for the queen. Now, I haven't had a chance to play this with the kids. I think they might dig it. This is a pass-the-stick role-playing game where you are all playing courtiers to a queen who you love. You are about to embark on a mission to the foreign country, 
and you play through a bunch of story prompts where someone reads off a card and then everyone else replies to an answer on that card. And then it passes to the next player and passes to the next player and so on. The end result is you end up telling a group story. And what amazes me about this game is there's no characters in this game, but I've never played a game with by the end, everyone didn't know who their character was. This is a great improv role-playing experience. It's definitely out of the box, but honestly, I think that's a good thing. If this is someone's first role-playing experience, I honestly think that's a good thing. Whereas if they're already a fan of like Dungeons and Dragons or something, here's a great way to play without needing all the dice and character sheets, maps, and minis. Yeah, absolutely. Next, I've got a game from one of our friends that we reviewed a couple weeks ago that I was like, yeah, there's no reason you couldn't bring that. And that is Circle of Six for Robert M. Everson, the old man Logan. This is a print-on-demand game you can get off drive through cards that is a simple, quick, take that card game where you are trying to collect the numbers one through six by playing your cards onto a circle of cards and then moving around a marker, either clockwise or counterclockwise. There's a little bit more to the game, but it's really about five minutes to teach and a round of the game is over really quick. And if you want, you can actually keep score between games to have an overall rank for who can win like the event by the end of the night. But playing an individual round is perfect for a lunch break or if your teachers are letting you play at the end of class. Absolutely. Uh, and actually, just jumping back a hair to the regular deck of cards, one I wasn't thinking of, but I just had a turn of in VGA, <laughs> is Haggis, uh, which does have its own deck of cards, but you can completely play that with a regular deck of playing cards as long as you just sort of keep in mind uh, what's up. But that's Haggis. One I haven't played, but perfect for the list, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. All right, next I have Roll For It. Now, the problem with this game is people have to be able to tolerate rolling of dice, lots and lots and lots of rolling of dice. So as long as you're in a spot where the clatter of rolling dice is fine, this can be a great answer. It is a very small box that you has a bunch of cards in it and a bunch of colored dice, different set of color of dice for each player. Uh, if you pick up different editions of the game, you get different sets of dice and you can actually play with more players. And then you have cards that have things on them like a set of four dice or three of a kind or six sixes. You roll your dice, you place them on the cards. Then you can re-roll again on your next turn. If you ever put fill the whole card, you get to keep that card and it's worth the points on. Really simple, really quick dice rolling game with a little bit of strategy to it on where you place your dice. Like, do you go for that? need six sixes and all you have is six dice so it's hard to roll but it's worth 10 points or you try to go for the easy two different pairs uh fun game quick to do just again rolling of dice on desks can be pretty loud and you roll a lot in this game it's not like a one roll and do stuff it's roll and then you roll then you roll then you roll until people grab all the cards it's almost like you need a uh, fold flat dice tray that you could slip into your backpack there you go that's a we, gaming accessories that you can put in your backpack and bring to high school. That's a, that's a topic for a later time. <laughs> but yeah, dice uh, some kind of dice roller would probably be pretty good. Next, I have the game, which depending on how old your kids are, they may have just lost. Uh, <laughs> this is a cooperative card game where you are trying to play all of the cards in the deck in order from 1 to 99. Now, the problem is you can't talk about your cards with the other players. Every turn, you have to play two cards. You have no choice. And there are three stacks. There are three, or sorry, four stacks. Two stacks that are going upwards, so from one to 100, and then two stacks going down from 100 to one. It sounds like it should be dead simple, but it is not. I have only ever won this game playing every card once, and the actual win, like that's a, your ultimate win. The actual win is only have 10 cards left. So that just shows how hard it is. That you're allowed to have up to 10 cards left and still win. This is another one that I did not expect to go over as well as it did with the kids. The kids loved this. They had a ton of fun playing it. And this has the advantage over the next game we're going to talk about because it's you can laugh and have fun and talk and socialize while you're playing. Absolutely. No, it's definitely uh, a blast. And it moves right into the next one which is of a very similar vein. Yes. So the next one is the mind. Here you again are trying to get all the cards played from one to a hundred, but you don't have to play them all. You just have to play them in order. You start off with a hand to one card and everyone sitting around the table has to play them in order. Then you, if you win that, you go to the second round, two cards, play them in order, all the way up to 13 cards played in order. The secret is you cannot communicate according to the rules at all. 
you are not allowed to say anything. You're not allowed to grin. You're not even supposed to lean in close to the table if you think it's time to play. Um, this plays very similar to the game, but you basically play in silence. So in a way, this could be perfect for school, or it could be terrible depending on what your game event is like. If your event's supposed to be everyone laughing, having fun, socializing, being loud, you probably want the game. If you're supposed to be quietly playing games while the other kids finish up their homework, the mind is a better choice. Absolutely. And of course, our next one gets back right into the loudness yes. all over again. Uh, this one, I, I, you know what? I, I put the list together and I was going to take some off. This one was probably going to come off, but I'll leave it here since it's on the list. And it's on my shelf behind. And that is Super Cats. This is a ridiculously silly game where you go super cats and then hold up a number of fingers. The person who held up the most fingers gets to flip over one of their cats, but then there's penalties and, and bonuses and, and, and rules that modify that. You have five cats. Once you flip them all over, they go super sentai and they're all powered up. Think Power Rangers. And then the game shifts to another way to play where that one player challenges the, the robo dog which you build with cards and have to defeat. Now it's that player versus the rest of the players who are playing the Robo Dog. Ridiculously silly, over-the-top game. Fantastic, cute, silly artwork. And can be a ton of fun, but I'm personally thinking this is more grade school level. I think some high school kids are going to find this a little too silly and dumb and possibly will not enjoy this one. But I did say these might be some game games on this list for grade schoolers. I think this one falls on the grade schooler level. Now, additionally, you don't have this one, so which is why it's not on the list, but they have just announced that there is going to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja mm -hmm. Turtles version of Super Cats. We don't know all the details yet, but uh, the news about it is out there. Yeah. Which that may be more appealing to high schoolers or not. I have no idea where, where um, Ninja Ninja Turtles are on the coolness scale right now. <laughs> all right. Next, I have Red 7. This is the game that at the end of the round, you must win. And if you're not winning, you lose. You start with the win condition is you must have the highest card in play. And it starts with you having the highest card in play. But then people can play other cards that change that rule that say you win if you have a pair. And well, if by the end of your turn, you don't change the rule and you don't have a pair, you're out. Really simple, but fascinating. I, I find this game just blows me away by how interesting it is and the way it works, because that's it. That's the rules. By the end of your turn, you have to be winning. So if your tableau in front of you doesn't have you winning based on the current rule, you need to change the rule. And while the hands limits and the cards, and there's only seven cards, one through seven, and I have ooh, a bunch of different colors, like the whole rainbow, I don't know, eight different colors. And, and there's different rules for each of the colors. Then there's an added bonus where all like expanded advanced rules where all the odd number cards do other things like make you draw. And there's a whole system for points. As for high school playing, ditch all that special rules. Just play the basic one through seven. Play until someone's eliminated. Check and see if you have time to play another round. I really like this game. Now, showing this one to the kids, my daughter did think it was probably a step above where most of her friends would be. So again, I told her she hasn't brought any of these games yet. For all you know, you got closet gamers hiding everywhere in the group, and maybe <laughs> they'll pick stuff like this up quickly. But she's like, well, maybe after we try something like the mind of the game first, we might move to Red 7. Yeah, it's very interesting, uh, the, the complexity. Again, we've, we haven't talked, we actually haven't used this term in a while, but complexity emerging from yes. simplicity is, is, you know, is always fun. Next, we're getting into bigger boxes now. So, so these are, are quite a bit less portable after Red 7 was kind of the jump up to another size of box, right? You no longer had that thin box size. You're now talking about like thick cardboard board game boxes. Still pretty tiny, but not too big. So that's kind of a, a, a limit for, you know, can fit in the front pouch. Now we're into probably has to go into the backpack itself. And the first game I have is Parade. This is... Um, what do they call it? We talked about, I always forget the term of this, where you're playing a card game where you have to play cards in a row. Um, Guillotine uses it. And I know this is based on a traditional card game that I don't know. And what you are doing is you are making a parade in Alice in Wonderland. And then there's cards where if you play them, are going to take people out of the parade and you collect them. And it has to do with matching the previous suit. It's sequential card play, but I, I know there's a specific term, like a card line. Or you're building a card line that keeps getting better and as you add cards to the back of the line things happen to the line and the goal in this one is to actually collect people from the parade to make your own personal pile to score points the big bonus here is the look of this there's some beautiful looking cards alice in wonderland 
I to me seems very universal. It's not a kid's thing. Like, yes, you might have saw the, the Disney, but Alice in Wonderland seems to have universal appeal. I know many adults who still love Wonderland stuff. And I just think the theme of this one and the very similar to traditional gameplay, but with some hobby elements will make this one really appealing. Absolutely. And that was Parade. Then I have my second favorite push your luck game because I've discovered Quacks of Quedlinburg. Before there was Quacks of Quedlinburg, which you can't fit in your backpack and bring to school, there was Dead Man's Draw. This is a fascinating game where you have a deck of cards and you're going to flip the top card over, then make a choice. Do you keep going or do you draw again? You can keep doing that, but as soon as you match the suit of the last card drawn, you go bust and get nothing. In addition to that, every card that's flipped up has special rules where you can steal cards from other players, force to draw two more cards, draw three cards and pick one to put into play, and so on. The overall goal is to correct sets of these cards in front of you from the, I think it's seven to ten different suits, depending on the expansion you use. And you're going to flip up the card and then either claim everything that's already up or draw again. And that push your luck aspect is something teens, I think, are going to love. And it's it's the the drama of, oh, 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 oh. And then to make it even more interesting, there are Krakens in the deck, and Krakens make you bust automatically. So as the deck gets down, you're trying to count in your head how many Krakens are up and what your chances are. But then there's also Mermaids, which are worth way more points than other cards. It's like, oh, do I flip again or do I not? It honestly is a fantastic Push your luck game would be my favorite, but I've now discovered Quacks of Quindenburg. But this is way quicker, and I couldn't bring Quacks to school. Well, that was Dead Man's Draw. Next, I have Skull. This is another push your luck game that just kind of ended up all together. Um, Skull comes again, kind of chunkier box, and it's filled with square coasters and round coasters. Four round coasters, three of which are flowers, one's a skull. The thing here is you set your pile in front of you so you know what's in your stack. Then you go around for everyone playing and you bid on how many posters you can flip before revealing a skull. So I'm like, I know my skull is four down. So I know I can flip three. So I can start the bidding at three. And if I get through for three, I can just flip my three and win the round. But it's say then someone bids me up four, five, six, seven. Now I got to go around the table, go flip one, flip one, flip one, flip one. I'll flip one of mine, flip one, and try to get it so I don't reveal a skull. If I reveal a skull, I lose one of those four coasters. Once you're out of coasters, you're out of the game. If anyone is able to win two rounds in a row, they win overall. This is one where you're probably not going to get in a full game, but you could play multiple rounds of, and it's fun just playing a few rounds. I kept this on the list because personally, I'm like, eh, I don't know, high school, but my kids love this and I don't get it. Like, like I'm like, push your luck. And, and this is a game that started as a drinking game at, at bars with bikers. And it actually went over really well. But my daughter's like, I don't want to bring that to school. And I'm like, why not? And she's like, oh, the theme. And I'm like, well, it's skulls and roses. She's like, yeah, but the whole biker thing. I'm like, well, you don't have to tell people there's a biker <laughs> thing. I'm just telling you because you're my kids and I know the history of the game. So that one ended up getting knocked off the list for my daughter, but I still think may be a valid choice just by how much fun my kids had with it. Mental note, don't over-explain the history of these games. <laughs> yes. Yeah, don't, I guess just don't tell them. They're like, ooh, bikers. Bikers are bad? I don't know. I don't even know where they, they I don't even know my kids know what a biker means, to be honest. I probably should have asked. You know what a biker is? That would have been an interesting conversation. Now sit down and watch Sons of Anarchy. No, no, no. They're much too, much too, uh, much too young for that. But yeah, I think it was the drinking game part too. That could be it too. And that was Skull. All right, biggest hit from the night we sat down and played was Rumble in the Dungeon. I don't know. Uh, to me, this is a super light filler game where it's like we have five minutes to kill. So let's kill them. Like, 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 like let's play a quick game of Rumble in the Dungeon. But my kids adored this game. In this game, you're going to make a 12-room dungeon. The furthest room is the treasure room. You're going to put a chest in. You're then going to seed it with adventurers and monsters, one in each room. On your turn, you either move a character or you resolve a fight. When two characters are in the room together, they can't split up. One of them has to die. And that's one of the actions is to kill one of the other characters. Your goal is to be the last person standing. Now, the neat trick here is every round it's randomized who's what. So you are two of the 12 heroes are your characters. So you're trying to make sure that you are one of the last ones standing. Super simple game. There are other versions. Rumble in the house. If you don't like the dungeon theme, if you don't like fantasy, you can play. 
this is the game I expect my daughter to actually bring to school tomorrow, but I'm not certain. Even if they didn't, the kids are obsessed with this game. They love it. All right. Well, and that was Rumble in the Dungeon. Next, the um, most unique game on the list, which I have no clue how this would play out, bring it to school, but it's the right size box. Uh, and that's Stellar Conflict. This is a game that I keep forgetting about. Sean, I think, has to play if he hasn't tried it yet. So this is a uh, real-time pseudo-dexterity game where you get a bunch of square cards that have spaceships on them that have shields on some sides and lasers on multiple other sides. You're then going to put them out on the table wherever you want, and everyone's doing this at the same time. You're all putting it out until everyone's put all their ships on the table. You then resolve the big space battle that's happening by using elastics to trace line of sight between the various ships and do damage to each other. It is such a unique game. I had so much fun the, the, when I played this at Origins that I bought a copy instantly. I'm like, this is just different, unique, and I love doing the... The elastic for a line of sight was brilliant. I'm like, I stole that and started using it in D&D. They just have these straight... Like, basically, they took an elastic and cut them, but they're in the different player colors, and you just literally just, boop, yep, that hits, boop, yep, that hits, and the lasers have enough of a line on the cards. You can always do that. There's even a variant where you can put some um, mines out with gems on them that you can collect and stuff like that too. And there's even army building where instead of getting all the cards, you have so many points to buy ships with. I have no clue if this would work. It would definitely have to be again, where you're not like Shh, go play games in the corner. Like you're going to have to be loud. Um, plus it's probably going to draw in other people's attention, but I think the unique nature of this, of it being very video game, like I think would be appealing to teens. And that is Stellar Conflict. All right, I got three left. Next up is Yardmaster, though I'd probably recommend Express. They both come in the same size box, and Express is still in print. So I'm going to go with that. This is Yardmaster Express is a train building game. And with the Express version, unlike the one we just reviewed a couple weeks ago, it's a drafting game. You're given a hand of cards. You're going to pick one train card to add to your train and then pass the left to the player to your left or right, whichever. And then you're going to get another set. And you're going to do it again. Now, the new cards that are played have to match either the number or color of the last card played. And then this particular version, what you can do is if you don't have any cards that match, you can flip it over and it's a wild card. Now, the wild cards let you keep building your train, but are worth no points. So you want to try to be strategic and try to remember what's getting passed around and try to build the biggest train. Now, if you do, I would bring this. And then if the kids love it, then consider bringing the full yard master, which if you want details of that, you can check out our review, but it adds an actual market and trading and buying train cards and this really neat thing with the train yard where you can set up combos. But start with Express. If that goes over well, consider picking up the full game. Although that's out of print, but there is a free print and play. And that is Yardmaster Express. Next, I have Ratuki. Um, Ratuki is a what they call ladder building game where you're trying to play cards in order from one to five. So in this game, it's not technically one to five. It's one to five, but you can always play a card one above or one below the other. So you can go one, two, three, two, three, four, three, three, four, five to get to your stack of five. Everyone's trying to play through their entire deck. There can be multiple stacks going at once and you always have to match the number of the, the stack that's going underneath in the same color. So you gotta match, sorry, you don't match the number. Same color, number one, higher or lower. When a stack hits five, you say Ratuki, you can grab it. There's also a wild card system. I don't need to get into all the details. The biggest problem with this one is loud. It is really loud. Like people yelling Ratuki and going, oh, I've got a three, I got a four, I got a this. There's also a whole system where you can discard your cards to reshuffle them if you can't play and stuff like that. This one came out from the op and was way more fun than I thought it would be. And both my kids enjoy playing this one with large groups. So this one, I think can go over well, but again, you need, um, everyone has to stand really to be able to play. So you need the right play space and you are going to be loud. And loud isn't always welcome by many teachers in high yes. school. That was Retuki. Now, this one is the biggest game on the list and honestly would have brought everything full circle had I put the deck of playing cards first, which was my original idea. So I, I was trying to do a full circle thing, but I ended up mess switching with it and going with box size, and that is diamonds. So this is a almost traditional card game because it's based on games like hearts and spades and clubs. This is the diamonds game where your diamond suit matters. And the way the diamond suit works is that you are trying, sorry, you're, you're doing trick taking 
But along with it, you have this thing called your vault and you have little diamond beads basically in front of your vault that you're trying to get stored into your vault. While they're in front of your vault, they can be stolen. The way this works is when you play off suit, it does something. Now it's been a while since I played diamond, so I don't remember like what suits do what, but like one is like take a diamond from the bank and put it in front of your vault. Take all the diamonds from in front of your vault, put them into the bank, into the vault. Take a diamond from someone else's in front of their vault and put it in front of you and things like that. The actual score is only based on these diamond counters. Now this one, I think people are going to dig at a high school level if they're already fans of like Euchre and stuff. So this would be the one that like everyone in the class is playing traditional card games. You get to be the weird kid that shows up with the, the hobby version. And it could be the next step into getting them to try more interesting things. The disadvantage for this one is the little screens. So you have to be playing somewhere where you can put up a screen to hide how many diamonds you have from everyone. Fair enough. And that was Diamond. Now, one thing to note about all these games is that for many of them, you don't really need the box. Mm -hmm. You could make these games more portable. You could toss components into a bag and leave the bo uh, box at home. For games like, say, Diamonds, you're now down to the size of a plastic card box like Circle of Six comes in. And then with that, there were obviously a ton more games I could have tossed on the list. Like the first came to mind when I was looking around was Fuse or Splendor. Splendor fits in like a Ziploc bag this big. It, it, it's like fits in the palm of your hand. There's so much wasted space in that box. Now, I know one of our fans, Danielle uh, Major Kayla, who I didn't see in the chat tonight, once showed me these two photo cases, big plastic photo case that has a bunch of individual little cases in it where you can put labels on them. And they're, they're made to store and so, sort um, photos, like uh, camera photos, which people still know what those are, right? That people still print photos. I don't even know. <laughs> but anyway, they have two of these, and her and her husband keep these in their car, in the trunk. And this way, they have a ton of games on hand. If I remember correctly, it's 24 games, 24 fully complete, everything needed to play games in these two photo cases, which is just amazing. Now, you don't want to put one of those cases in your backpack, but there's no reason you couldn't just toss in a photo case. Now, once you remove the box, this list could be so much longer. But that's not something we're going to go into today. Uh, an entire topic could be games with way more wasted space than needed um, that can now fit into a backpack, even though they didn't originally. So what I'll do is I'll leave that for you to discover just how small a footprint your games can take up on your own that's uh, there's some homework see what's what what is the game you can condense down to the smallest space uh if you'd like you can google something called i only just learned about called reboxing where yeah. people take boxes games and shrink them down trying to use the using the original box and trimming it and shrinking it mm -hmm. down to the actual size it needs to be while still keeping as much of the game art as they can on the front yeah, right now there's a huge trend of doing that with Furnace. I guess Furnace has a lot of air in that box. Right. Well, that's it for our list of games that a teenager might toss into a backpack and bring with them to high school. All right, lobbyists, what have you got for us? Are there any games we missed? What did you think of the games on our list? And what games have your kids been bringing to school? All right, I'm going to start off with a comment from Brian Van Beek while you scroll back through the chat, because I got to say the lobby was awesome for this one. I saw all kinds of recommendations in there, some of which we mentioned and some we did not. So Brian Van Beek, one of our patrons, our awesome patrons, thank you, Brian, has taken their, their kids have taken the following to school at one point or another. One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which is their favorite game. That wasn't on my list because it's social deduction. I think everyone knows that, but I think it's actually a great choice. Um, honestly, the full werewolf. And I'd be actually, I wonder if this generation of children right now know Mafia Werewolf. I, I wonder if that's a thing that is happening. When we were in school, that definitely didn't exist. Like, I'm sure it existed, but we never saw it. But like, to be honest, high school is like the perfect place to play werewolf or mafia or that style of game. Whereas the one night version definitely distills it down to a card game and, and a little more gamer game. Next is Pit, which is an auction game that comes with its own bell. Uh, my concern here is how loud the bell would be. It's a real time buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell, ding. Stock market closes, see who won. Uh, Flux, uh, personally not a fan of Flux. I don't own any copies of Flux, but you know what? With the, the, the various 
the speed that game can play and how silly it is probably would be very popular with high schoolers. I can totally get it. Just not my personal favorite game, mainly because anytime I play it, people tend to play with more players than the player count says, which I didn't realize until now playing it with the proper player count. It makes a difference, right? Because the number of cards that are out in play. Plus, people like to mash the expansions together and some work together better than others. Next, I've got the, the rare occurrence of a game I have never heard of, which is Campy Creatures. Then When I Dream, which is a bigger box, but the kids and their friends really like it. We talked about this one on, as an honorable mention a couple times. This is a, a game where a player is dreaming and is blindfolded or keeps their eyes closed while other players tell them what they're dreaming. But some of them are, are have a hidden role and they're, they're lying about what you're dreaming about. This one sounded really neat. And while they play where words a lot, but using the app without having to take any tokens with them, which makes perfect sense. So where words, of course, is a version of werewolf, but it's a word guessing game where one of the characters, again, is the werewolf and is feeding misleading clues. Uh, where if they give too many clues, they get pointed out that they be, be a werewolf and then the, the, the werewolf loses. Right. So you have to give like just subtle enough clues. Um, notes their kids are 13 and 14 and are still on the younger side and again that's the age group i was looking at as well absolutely uh so we've yeah this has been a great chat thank you very much yes. so much for everyone uh hopping in there uh we've got uh, a whole bunch of things we're going to start in here with the first thing we got is uh word games anything word games no actually i didn't um, put any word games on the list but you know what? Again, if you get rid of the box, so stuff like letter jam, well, letter jam's a little complicated. Trap words would probably be good with the smaller box. Um, always recommend boggle. Boggle like takes up as much room as that cube, basically. Yep. Other than that, you need a piece of paper, right? To play boggle. I think boggle would be a good call. Um, but anagrams, I don't own it, but I think would be a good one because um, you can just throw it in a pocket. Um, travel quirkle, Deanna pointed out, is another good one. I, I definitely can see word games. I just didn't see any the only one i own that's a small box is a little wordy and i figured two players is not what we were going for tonight uh tuari mentioned something called fort i'm not familiar but uh fort is from the designer who did um root with the similar style arts and it's all about building your own fort like a tree fort okay. your kids building a fort it does look really good have not gotten to try that game though so i fort is on my it's leader games i want to try it it looks great but i haven't played it myself so i think it's probably a good recommendation and from what i hear it's way way lighter than root it's no coin game in disguise it's a it's it's a silly light game now pax mentioned this and i'm pretty sure it was mentioned in our discord as well sushi go party or sushi go or sushi go version my um, the box for that's surprisingly big i think that's one where you'd have to take the cards out of the box fair enough now it isn't a tin which is a bonus so, oh, that's one I missed. I missed Breakdancing Meeple. I must have missed it on my shelf. Breakdancing Meeple goes on my list. <laughs> so jumping back in time, Breakdancing Meeple, the game about rolling Meeple, and then trying it. To me, like I, I recommended Roll For It. Breakdancing Meeple is the fun version. Not that Roll For It's not terribly fun, but it's just more silly and fun. The problem with that is you need some kind of timer. That's the only problem with Breakdancing Meeple. If your kids are allowed phones, there's an app, it's free, and it's great because it like does hurry up, great moves, you know, as timers kind of, we're almost out of time, you know. The Breakdancing Meeple goes on my list. Um, the Sushi Go versions I've seen is is a bigger box than anything on my list. But again, all it is is cards. Yeah, there's so no if you reason can take for the cards out, you could probably resize that pretty easily. Uh, next, we have uh, Obligatory Rhino Hero. I, high school kids, would they put up with Rhino Hero? That's... If the problem is you have to hide it. You have to, you have to hide, and I, even the cards look cartoony. I think I think you would have a bunch of people scoffing at the look of that game, but they're missing out because it is a great game. Yep. That's uh, why I didn't put Gokuku on the list. For one, it's tall, but also I just figured with the kitty art, there's no way you're going to convince high schoolers to play that game unless they're in their teens, older teens, and you involve some underage things. <laughs> Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, kicks or quicks, quicks, kicks, quicks. Uh, that is a roll and write. It's it's basically the most famous roll and write because it was more mass market. I think it's from Game Right. It's a you know roll the dice, fill it out. It's it's advanced Yahtzee. Right. I can totally see it, but again, you, all you got to worry about is the the sound of dice on desks it concerns me. Right. Well, you you mentioned boggles, so <laughs> uh, well, yeah, dice note sounds. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what else? The Ultra, Tuari mentions the Ultra Tiny Epic series. 
haven't had a chance to look into those. So the tiny epic games aren't nearly as tiny epic. Well, they're not nearly as tiny as I would have liked. They're, they're, they're small compared to anything else. They're neat games, but lots of components too, which is something else you got to worry about when bringing stuff to school is losing components. Whereas most of the games we listed were just cards, right? Like you, there's no little bits to lose. Don't know Love Letter does have tokens, but you can use something else. I have not gotten to actually see any of the tiny epic games. Probably a good recommendation. I just haven't looked into them. I'll admit I wasn't a huge fan of most of the tiny epic games myself. Some were better than others. Galaxies was kind of neat. I did not like zombies. I never got to try the one that's Final Fantasy Tactics. That one looked pretty good. Uh, Ryan's saying, uh, expects her to be too cool for uh, Love Letter, maybe Cthulhu Love Letter instead. Which pretty much goes with why I recommended uh, Lucha Jefe. Yeah. Because I, I figured the theme of Love Letter, they throw in Batman Love Letter. Right, Batman Love Letter actually has some rule variants too that are supposed to be pretty good. And if I remember, I saw Cat Attack noted uh, that they own eleven different versions or so of uh, Love eight, Letter. I think was there eight, was, eight yeah. different versions of Love Letter. Fair enough. Yep. I, I have the original, but so when it came out over here, they rethemed it to medieval. But the original was actually Japanese, and I have the deluxe version that used the original Japanese art. That is the version I own because I like the way it looks. And I only own it. So when other people come over and say, let's play Love Letter, I have a copy to go, okay, let's play Love Letter. Right. Uh, Pax is saying their team loves Coop. Coop, that's, that's another social deduction, but very quick. So to me, Coop is Love Letter to the next level. It's everyone has roles that are in front of them and you're using cards and playing against each other, but people are on two different teams and you're trying to figure out which team they're on, who are the, I think it's saboteurs and the, the main characters. Totally get it. Of all the social deduction games out there, that is one I actually do enjoy and have played multiple times. I just don't enjoy it enough to play it myself. But if people show up and are like, let's play Werewolf, I'm like, no. Let's play One Night Ultimate Vampire, I'm like, no. If they're like, let's play Coup, and I'm like, all right, as long as we play something else after. So you can convince me to play Coup, so I get it. Fair enough. Uh, and she games the thing. She used to bring a tarot deck to go and play Tarok, but yeah. uh, doesn't remember the rules anymore. Yeah, I remember it was Euchre-like. That's, yeah. that's all I remember. I remember her trying to teach me. That's about it. Um, yeah, tarot deck. The, the only one with that is you got to worry about some people having misguided ideas about what a tarot deck is for. And it may not be accepted at some schools. Fair enough. And, uh, and fair enough, some won't even allow you to bring playing cards because they consider it gambling. And some won't allow dice. Um, if you are in those places, get your kids to another school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ryan's saying, I think there's a chance for some board games to be repackaged more compactly if yeah. their boards can be swapped for roll up game mat. And that is absolutely That's a good call. Uh, a, you know, a neoprene mat or some form of mat is definitely a lot of the, you know, you can take up yeah. a lot less space if you're removing the board from mm -hmm. the board game. Or you just take a pair of scissors to your board and cut it up so it fits in a smaller. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> I mean, someone's shivering out there in <laughs> listener land. They're like, Ugh. they just got to switch. No, honestly, um, I think someone noted this in chat too. I'm sorry, I didn't catch who. But the box size in most cases is determined by the board. That's why so many of these are card games. Um, most of the boxes back there are enough to fit one deck of cards. So once you get into a board game, you got to fit that board somehow. So that's definitely a an issue. And I, I love it. Or, or like, I don't know, can you photocopy a board and laminate it? Like, like paper, make it out of paper and laminate it or something. There's, there's probably lots of ways to actually yeah. shrink down boards. Uh, Math Guy Dave's thought of more games. Uh, he mm -hmm. only had Sushi Go on Discord, but he would add Dungeon Mayhem and Hero Realms. Hero Realms, isn't that two player? That's my concern with Hero Realms. Like, I know Star, like, mostly two player, like, maybe there's a variant. Like Star Realms, to me, is a two-player game. Yes, there's a six-player variant. Yes, there's a four-player variant. Um, honestly, to add to that list, there's Pokemon and Magic the Gathering that kids have been bringing to schools for years. Although Probably should have been on this generally list. Generally not allowed anymore. Yeah. Well, once you get to high school, I thought they were. Mm, no, I know they were banned from many, high, many grade schools uh, due to kids ripping off other kids. But I think once you get to high school, I think they're allowed. Possibly not. But yeah, to be honest, the whole gamut of CCGs could be a good recommendation. And Hero Realms plays up to five. Oh, there you go. See, I always thought of it as a two-player game. So totally fair if Hero Realms plays up to five. I honestly have no experience with that. And I've, I think I've explained this before. I tried it when it first came out. And at that point, it was basically a copy of, of, of Star Realms. You didn't even have the hero cards at that point. And I hear it's fantastic and I need to dig into it. Dungeon Mayhem's a D&D &D game. I share deals on it all the time. That's about all I can tell you. 
um possibly good and then there's all like the one deck dungeon those might be good as well again i did basis list on my list what i will do uh, to my chagrin is try to include all these in the show notes which means i'm (laughs) going to be going back and listening to this because i'm not actually taking notes right now uh one thing is pointed out uh, i feel like werewolf could be awful if the kids are being mean Yes, there is the, the the kid who always gets killed the first round, I'm yeah. sure is a thing. So that's fair. Uh, One of the things I don't like about Werewolf. <laughs> uh, Jabuka is another one. If you re- Although repackage it because the bag sheds. Well, yeah, if you're okay with the bag shedding. <laughs> Jabuka's all right. You know what? We should mention that to Gwen because she loved Jabuka. Mainly because she kicked my butt in it. <laughs> that's what happens when your daughter reads more books in a week than I've read in my entire life. Well, there you go. Totally fair. All right. Well, I think we've uh, made it through our chat room now. I got to thank all of you for that. That was, that was, that is a lot of suggestions. That's the most game suggestions we've had in a long time. I love seeing it. Lots of stuff that wasn't on our list it is fantastic. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on ask the bellhop or email me at Questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our look at the Veil Dancer Hero Pack for Aventuria, featuring a new hero and a short 18 plus adventure. Thanks to Ulysses Spiel for sending us a copy of this expansion to check out. All right, so the Adventuria Adventure Card game was designed by Michael Palm and Lucas Zack, and this still uses that same system. Now, the short adventure in this expansion was written by Christian Lonsing, and the entire thing was localized to English under the eye of Timothy Brown. Artwork is from Verena Biscop, Jamila Knopf, Christopher Kraus, Julia Metzger, Nikolai Osterog, and Mia Steinberg, Steingraber. Now, the English version of this expansion was published by Ulysses Spiel in 2020, after being part of a successful Kickstarter project, but due to global shipping issues, still is not available in stores. So supposedly copies are out there. We managed to get one as a preview, but you still can't get this at your local store. And unfortunately, I can't tell you when you will be able to. I think you can pre-order it online now, but that's it. Now, this hero pack is an expansion for the Adventure Adventure card game, which is required to use all of the contents of this box. This is not a standalone adventure. For more information on Aventuria, check out our reviews on the blog, YouTube, and the podcast. The Veil Dancer Hero Pack contains a new hero, Karima Al Jamila, a Novati Starazai. This character can be used both for the competitive dual mode of Aventuria as well as for cooperative campaign play. Now, speaking of campaign play, this box also contains a short one act adventure titled Orgy of Thorns which is designed to be played using the new hero and up to five other adventurers, though it actually requires at least two others we learned while playing. Now, this adventure is aimed at adult players and may contain erotic euphemisms, is how it is worded in the book. For a look at the components you get in this box, making sure not to spoil the story at all, check out our Safe for Work unboxing video of the Veil Dancer Hero set on YouTube. Now, as far as quality goes, the cards and everything matches the quality of the base game, which is extremely important for an adventure card game. They nailed it. Um, It includes both a full deck for Karima, a reference card explaining her unique card type, which are dances, and all the cards needed to play through Orgy of Thorns. There's also a small 14-page booklet that has the adventure text, as well as a two-page character background for your new Novati Sharazad. So nothing one wouldn't expect from any Aventuria expansion, really. Yeah, this is the second of the hero packs we've opened up. Um, The first one being uh, the Alchemist. Oh, no, this was the first one we opened, actually. Sorry. We opened this one, but another one we've opened up, and they all seem to have the same thing. So you get a new character and a short story. Now, note, this expansion is for the second printing of Aventuria, though compatible with first. So it uses cards to track health. So there's no life wheel. Nor is there one for this character included in the Wheel of Life expansion, which we've reviewed in the past. Oddly, there is also no character token in the box. So you are going to have to substitute another character token or find some other randomization method when playing. Because you do use that when you're randomizing damage or to see whose turn, who acts as first player. 
Yeah, the health is easy enough, but the token is a pain. It would have been nice to have standardized these a little better. But let's start with this new hero. Karima Al Jamila is a Novadi Sharasad, the last surviving member of the seven Ahmad Sunni, trained by the swordmaster Rashdul on a quest to rescue her mother from the clutches of the Lord of Vengeance. <laughs> She is a master of the Novati tradition of the Rakisa and the Nine Dances of Rastula. So this is all represented by a hero deck featuring a brand new card type and mechanic, Dances. Karima's deck contains a number of dance cards, oddly only six, not nine, given the background, each of which are permanent cards that, when played, get three tokens on them. At the end of each round, a token is removed from all dances that are in play, and once the last token is removed from a dance, it goes in your discard pile. Now, along with this, Karima's special ability that can be used once per game is to add one token to each in-play dance. And she also has some non-permanent cards that can also add tokens. Now, each dance has a different in-game effect, including things like increasing her damage, giving her defense, improving her chance to hit, giving her a better dodge chance, distracting enemies, excuse me, and distracting enemies by adding to their roles when they act on the villain turn. With this, she also has a number of equipment cards that work better once she has at least two dances in place. So you're always encouraged to have at least two going. While she doesn't have as much armor, she does, though, have the highest dodge rating in the entire game. Uh, this includes some sets we haven't opened. I verified that one online. This is the highest dodge you get with a nine um, with cards and equipment that can make it even higher than nine. So more than a, by the time you get her built up, it's a more than a 50% chance she will dodge any attack. Which is not a big shock to see a dancer have a high agility. It's pretty thematic. Now, despite coming with an 18 plus adventure, there's nothing that would make this hero and her deck and the cards in it not safe for work. Now, there's definitely nothing erotic, and there's not even any euphemisms here, which I think is good, because this means you can easily add this character to the rest of your Aventuria stuff and use it in other games without having to worry about the age of the players who may be playing her or with her. Indeed, while some of the art might be considered vaguely suggestive, it's still less suggestive than, for instance, many TV commercials during a U.S. sports ball game. Fair enough. Now, as for thoughts on how she plays, stay tuned to the later part of this review where I'll be sharing my thoughts after summarizing what you get in the expansion and how to play. Well, now that we know about our new hero, how about you tell us a bit about the included adventure without spoiling anything and keeping things safe for work? Well, the included adventure is called Orgy of Thorns. So much for safe for work. <laughs> Again, just suggested. Uh, it's meant to be for adults only and for pretty good reasons. While there's no nudity or sexual acts depicted on the cards, the henchmen do feature some suggestive artwork, and you will find a similar piece of artwork in the adventure itself. There's just the one. Now, despite being a single act, this adventure includes not one, but two combats with featuring some very cool and interesting use of the game mechanics to tie those two combats together. As we've been finding with all of the adventure expansions, this is awesome to see because I love seeing what they've done to make every combat and story feel different. I'm always surprised when I try something new for adventure and I'm like, because like the whole game could just be sit down, fight a combat, sit down, fight a combat. And the things they've done to add variety have really impressed me. So not your uh, kid's adventure, but still yet another enjoyable and exciting adventure. I would say yes. So I'll get into my details with some issues I did have with it. Now, as for this whole adult thing, the content here is both erotic and violent. Now, the name Orgy of Thorns should have probably given me a bit of a hint with that. This is definitely an orgy of flesh and blood. Uh, the story refers to it specifically as an orgy of violence to seal a pact with the Mistress of Bloody Ecstasy. And while the book states there are erotic euphemisms, they're pretty dang blatant, like the well-endowed swordsman whose main attack is to show you his saber. What I wouldn't call this adventure at all is titillating. And it's got a lot of male power fantasy vibe out of the story, which some people probably won't enjoy. 
Now, the most important thing to note here, though, for anyone thinking of playing this adventure is that there is a complete lack of player agency in regards to what happens to your characters in this adventure. And that's going to be a no-go for some players, and I fully understand. Now, I get it. This isn't a role-playing game. This is a card game that has a very linear story structure that goes from point A to point B to point C. And the lack of choice and decision points, to be honest, is something we've had in all adventure area modules. They're not which way books. But what happens to your characters here is completely non-consensual. Due to this, I strongly suggest talking about this and getting everyone at the table to agree to be part of that, knowing that the story may take them places that they wouldn't want to go with their characters. You may even want to go so far as to have someone pre-read the adventure so you can bring up specific parts you might want to veil during play. It's a bit frustrating that the box wasn't clearer with its content warnings. Yeah. This seems to contain some really problematic content for some people completely removed from the innuendo and titillation that it seemed like we were getting. Yeah, it just wasn't at all what we expected. And that could have been definitely put more clear. Now, one final note on the adventure. The pirate, despite it saying that it's for Karima and up to five other heroes, there is a part in the adventurer where it has two heroes, specifically not Karima, who have to make a test. And well, unless you're playing with at least three players total, you're not going to have these two other characters. So three to six players, or you're going to be in trouble then. In a way. Now, I'll admit when we played, we only played two players and we just kind of went with it. The one player made that test. But story-wise, it didn't quite work, though we kind of made it work in our own headcanon. Now, once you are completed this erotic adventure, or if you choose not to play the erotic, erotic adventure at all, which honestly is a very valid choice, you do get a new set of adult-themed henchmen cards that you could now add to the rest of your Aventuria stuff and potentially have them come up in future games. The way you build a henchman deck every game is you look through all your cards you own and pull out the ones with certain keywords. Well, all of these henchmen have the human and guard keywords, and both of those are pretty common in Aventuria combats that I've seen. Now, the deck also does include one mage, which I thought was cool, but every single one of these new henchmen have the Belkello keyword, which is the demon god of pleasure or whatever that's being worshipped in this adventure. And the included adventure calls for you to use every guard you have that has the Belkello keyword, which means you use the entire deck from this set and none of the stuff that had come out previous to this. So it makes sure you get these adult theme henchmen in play for this adventure. The other thing that's worth noting is there's no new other story cards. So sometimes you get events or demon abilities or summon cards or what players are going to be more interested in reward cards. There's none of that in here. Now to make up for the lack of rewards, this adventure, which is only a short one act adventure is actually worth two XP instead of the usual one. Well, it's nice that they gave that little extra kick rather than just ignoring the lack of re rewards. Yes. Well, now that we know what we're getting in this box and some idea of what to expect from the adventure, how mm -hmm. about you share your thoughts on this Aventuria expansion? Okay, so Deanna and I broke this out um, on a date night, game night. Uh, we expected this to be something fun to play. We'd play a lot of games together. And we were kind of hoping, like it's Veil Dancer, it says it's 18 plus to actually be a little titillating. Uh, we were looking to possibly add some excitement to the night, right? And straight up, no, uh, the, that was not a good choice of game with that goal in mind. Um, we will just say that it probably um, did the opposite effect <laughs> of, of what we were hoping it would attend. But before I get into why, I want to start with some of the good bits, though. And we'll talk, start by talking about the, uh, the character, the, the new character you get with this pack. So Deanna took on the role of Karima Al-Jamila, and I played my personal favorite Aventuria character so far, which is Arbosh the Dwarf Blacksmith. Now, Deanna found Karima pretty easy to play, picked up how the deck worked quickly enough, and really enjoyed the new dance mechanic. Like every Aventuria character, it did take a bit to build up a tableau of dances and talents and equipment, but once she did, the deck just had a very solid flow to it with various dances coming into play and going well and get going away and being replaced by other ones. And then the ability to combo different dances for different effects was very cool. And the character proved to be very effective, especially in this particular adventure, 
with a number of abilities that caused the enemy to add to their die rolls, which was particularly important in this case. Now, the one thing I did notice, that Karima doesn't seem to be very interactive, doesn't seem to work well with the other characters. There weren't a lot of abilities that you played that affected other players, like having them draw cards or get health or anything like that. They seem very centered on this character alone. Overall, Deanna really enjoyed playing this character, and honestly, there's a really good chance it may become her new favorite. After trying her in a few more adventures, she's only played the character once. But right now, she's ranked second under Carolyn Calavanti, the half-elf rogue, which is her current favorite character. Well, great that she'll have someone to play when I steal the rogue from her when I'm down. <laughs> now, as for the adventure, I don't even know where to start. So let's start with the positive. Let's stick to positive. Mechanically, this was the best adventure adventure we played thus far. Out of all the adventures in the core box, the poltergeist, and what we played through in Forest of No Return. It did some very different and cool things with the mechanics of the game, where you play through one combat, and once it's over, you leave most of everything set up. You, you leave your tableaus in play. Some of the stuff clears, but a bunch of it stays. You then continue the story, making, um, there's one particular check scene where you could technically lose the game if you rolled enough critical failures in a row, and then start a new combat with everything still out from the first one, which was fascinating. So interesting. So I'm not sure about uh, being able to lose the game on a check, but it's nice to see that they're still able to bring new ideas to the table and keep the mechanics of the game new and interesting. Thankfully, it's not one die roll for the lose the game, but I actually, to be honest, I appreciate it because it was nice to have a way to lose that wasn't in combat to see that they've expanded it that way. So the stuff between combats isn't just gain a fate point or lose it. So I thought that was kind of neat. And, then, and honestly, it's one of those, if you fail, another character can try. Plus, you can also just choose to lose health to re-roll. So you would have to roll an awful lot of 20s to actually fail out at this point, but it is definitely possible. Now, what I loved about this is that it changed one of the things I don't like about Aventuria, which is that you reset to zero between fights. I always found that thematically made no sense. Why would my character escape from the guards, go out into the woods and take all their armor off and forget all their skills and then have to start over when the wolves attack? I always thought that was silly. So I love the way things carried over from combat to combat. I was also very happy to see a one act short adventure feature two fights because I was totally expecting make one or two checks, have a fight and be done. And it was really fascinating to play a fight where at the start, you're buffed, you're ready, you're all equipped, you're good to go. All your cards are in play. That was actually a lot of fun. Now, along with this, the mechanics for the henchmen were interesting and thematic, uh, amusing in a way. Every single one of them has their highest result, which in most adventure henchmen is either do nothing or run away. Instead, said that in a way they got really into what was going on and lost a ton of health, usually 2d6, but were so into it, they kept going. So it was this whole aspect of losing yourself which is the entire part of the story and what the people who worship this god do is they lose themselves in the moment. I thought that was really neat because with this, it was possible for henchmen to keep rolling this result and just do a ton of damage to themselves. Now, to compensate for this, all of these new henchmen start with more than 20 health. When you're used to fighting three health bats, seeing a 26 health guard come out and only have a threat rating of four, you're kind of like, whoa, until you see this effect in play. Now, this is where Karima's ability to affect enemy die rolls and make them higher made her so powerful in these fights. Interesting, because as though although it's a powerful ability, regardless, doing damage with that mechanic is so far unique to this adventure set. Yeah, I haven't seen anything else that has high numbers like that. But her thing's going to be great when you're doing that thing where you're fighting henchmen, and if the boss is already dead, they run away. Like it's just a really neat mechanic or ability that's different from all the other characters. Now, a potential issue here is putting these henchmen in with the rest of your cards. Well, this whole pushing themselves beyond and going and losing themselves fit really well for this particular adventure, right? You're in an orgy, as it's going on. 
I'm not sure if having a mounting mistress show up with the town guard when trying to escape town and having her exhaust herself during the resulting combat might seem a little odd and off theme at the time. So due to this, I think you're going to have to make a call whether or not to include these cards or not when playing other cooperative adventures. Like personally, what I fear I'm doing is I put them in the deck and if they come up, I'm going to look at the tone of the adventure we're doing and what's happening and decide if we keep it or not or just throw it to the bottom of the pile. Indeed, sometimes the theme doesn't matter quite as much, and you're just bashing some interesting hench folk. But now, how about we move on to the problematic parts of this mm -hmm. adventure? Now, I'm going to add a content warning here. Some of the next part specifically deals with descriptions of BDSM and a lack of control that some might understandably be not comfortable with. Yes, very fair and fair warning. So first off, as I already mentioned, there is a serious lack of agency in this adventure. Regardless of whether you win or lose the first fight, your character is seduced and forced to act according to a vampire's will. Now, the language here is particularly cringy, with Karmia, Karima, sorry, Karima being referred to as a mare that needs to be broken. Now, at this point, I'm not going to spoil it, but I feel I need to kind of quote this to kind of get across the language and tone of this. So feel free to skip ahead 30 seconds if you don't want, uh, maybe a little more than 30 seconds, uh, however long it takes me to read this, um, if you want to hear it. So, thus another Novati has fallen into my hands. I already broke her sister, and now it is her turn. When I put the reins on her, she rears up. She is powerful and passionate, and I want to keep her that way. But I must still chastise her to keep her compliant. With her sister, I proceeded gently so as to not break her. However, over the course of her training, I came to know and appreciate the strength and endurance of her bloodline. Therefore, I take less care now with the new mare and rear her with a hard hand. Sometimes I use the whip until a gentle touch is enough to trigger voluptuous excitement and shy submission. Now, if I were reading a novel about a demonic presence, that would be one thing. But this is a game referring to one of the characters being played by the mm -hmm. group. This isn't just some NPC you failed to save. This is describing someone at the table as well. Right. That is the problem here is most people playing Adventure are going to have some ownership and tied to the character they're playing. Right. They are going to care what happens to that player. And you have no choice but to sit through this. Then there's another section later on where characters are forced to bring forth the rows together through the use of body control. This is the part where you need at least three players, and the adventure basically forces the other players to have sex with each other in order to progress the plot. And you can actually lose the game by failing at it. All of this is written from the perspective of the vampire which would be an interesting touch for storytelling reasons. Like, this is totally different. Every other story is like, historically, these heroes went and had an adventure. But reading it from the perspective of the vampire who got to sleep with the two sisters just feels like a right male power fantasy. Now, along with this, the story doesn't even fit the background. Like, Karima's background story is she's looking for her lost mother. But this adventure implies she's searching for her sister, who's become part of this cult. There's nothing about the mother in here or the, the Lord of Vengeance. It's some other god. And the whole bridging combat mechanic was awesome to play, but the way it works in the story doesn't really fit because they're two separate instances that happen with time passing. Like, it just didn't quite work. And then there's also the fact that this really isn't that erotic. Um, it's, I don't know, it almost feels like high school giggles more than anything else, right? And I should have realized with Orgy of Thorns that it was more of an orgy of pleasure and pain and with more slaughter along with the sex. Like, I just, I expected an 18 plus adventure to be suggestive and perhaps titillating, but it wasn't that at all. It was kind of gross and somewhat shameful. Yeah, this is really much more of a BDSM fantasy romp with demons than any sort of Arabian Nights Shahrazad adventure, as one might guess by looking at the box, which is really what it in implies. Totally agree. Now, ignoring the ridiculously cringeworthy story, we did end up having a lot of fun telling our own version of the story while playing. Um, with Deanna's veil dancer doing her dances and removing veils and either distracting or exhausting the guards, 
Uh, my dwarf spent the entire adventure trying to get dressed as quickly as possible and get the heck out of there. Um, this happened organically because I could not draw a weapon card to save my life and drew every one of my armor cards in order. So it was put the boots on, okay, put the pants on, okay, put the helmet on, put the, that's what I did for the first half of the game. Now, eventually our boss reached a point where he couldn't take it anymore and started smashing heads and then things wrapped up pretty quickly. Um, but there was other story elements, like I ended up in a pretty personal vendetta with a serpent, certain whip-wielding henchman that ended up being really difficult to finish off, who then came back in the second adventure. So we ended up telling a pretty good story out of it, but we were pretty much doing our own headcanon and ignoring what we were told was happening. First, those resilient henchmen. So overall, we had a lot of fun playing this adventure despite its ridiculous story. Mechanically, it was awesome. This was actually the best adventure adventure I played. The two linked combats were a ton of fun. The new henchmen actually being ended up being pretty interesting and entertaining. Like despite being silly and saying things like they show you their sword. Uh, the actual mechanics for what they were doing was kind of cool. And I actually really like the, they lose themselves and take damage mechanic. It fit really well. And the twist between the two combats was awesome. I shared with Sean what it was and I thought it was really neat because I'd never seen anything like that. I don't want to spoil it here. I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. The new character is solid. As I said, Deanna, this, this could be her new favorite. And I look forward to seeing how Karima fares in other adventures. As for the new henchmen, they were great for this adventure, but I'm not sure. You're going to have to make a call whether you want to use them in future adventures or not. So luckily, leaving them in or taking them out all as one or individually is completely yeah. viable either way, thanks to this flexible system. Yeah, when you build a henchman deck, it's up to you which henchman to include. You're just limited by keywords. You don't have to put any of these in. As for who should possibly pick up this adventure, if you enjoy Aventuria, I strongly pit, suggest picking this up. This is a great new character. Pick it up just to get Karima al Jamil. She's a very solid character, can be a ton of fun to play. She has a lot of great dueling cards, great for competitive play, and played very well during a cooperative adventure. The new dance mechanic is interesting and fun, and makes for a deck that flows in interesting ways, which again just fits the theme. Now, along with this great character, you get some other stuff that you may or may not want to use. The biggest question would be whether or not your group would enjoy the included short adventure. Mechanically, it's solid. By far the best adventure we played, but it's rife with problematic content and lack of player agency, and that's not going to be for everyone. I strongly suggest someone in your group read through the adventure first, then make sure everyone is on board before playing. And even with this, you may want to self-edit the adventure, skipping over some of the more juvenile content. Well, that's it for our review of the Veil Dancer Hero set for the Aventuria Adventure Card Game. I invite you to also check out Mo's written review of this game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so along with digital plays of Zolkin, Clans of Caledonia, and now two different games of Castles of Burgundy, I welcome Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, to the group, though Sean Hamilton and Sean from... Now I confuse myself. They're both there. Both Seans are playing. Thanks for joining us, Sean. Um, I've got two things off the pile of obligation this past week, which is awesome. So the first, of course, was the Veil Dancer hero set for Aventuria, which I just talked about during our review segment and was kind of a mixed bag. Uh, this one was hard to review because it was both at the same time our best adventure experience and our worst. Like the combat was fun. Uh, we told a really amusing story while playing, but the secluded plot and story was terrible. Like it was bad enough. I felt guilty reading out loud. And as I'm reading it and Deanna's listening, like seriously, they went there? Really? I, I'm so glad we didn't live stream that. Yeah, content warnings only go so far for some things like that. Next up, Deanna and I tried Outland versus C for the first time. And so far, I got to say, Good Games Publishing has done it again. While this game is much quicker and lighter than their other games, like Funfair, Unfair, and Guildmaster, 
still really solid with surprising depth. Basic rules are dead simple. They claim it can be taught in under two minutes, I'd say under five. Um, and that's what we use first game. So it's all about, you got hexagonal tiles and you're matching the edges and the edges are either land or sea. You then get points for completing things. Land gets points for completing land and sea gets points for completing water. Then there's a couple special tiles that let you steal from your opponent or get extra turns. And there's some marks on the tiles that give you points to the person who closed the area, even if it's for the other player. That's about it for the basic rules. I know that was well under two minutes, but if I was showing you the tiles, it would have took longer. Um, with that, I was surprised by how much depth there was just with those rules, with the very basic match land, match C, maybe get an extra turn. Yeah, I have to say, I really like the look of it after watching the unboxing, and I'm interested to uh, hear more about it as it comes on. Now, after we played with the basic rules, we did try one of the advanced rule options. So there are optional scoring rules you can add in. Um, the ones we added in were the rules for coral reefs and mountains. This added a whole new level of planning and decision points. This game was solid with the basic rules, but even more cutthroat and interesting with these. There is more planning ahead and looking for what the player can do and what they can draw next, which was really cool. Now, added to that, there are other optional scoring methods like waypoints, and then combining the waypoints with reefs and mountains that we still haven't tried. Plus, we've obviously only played two players so far, so we do have a lot left to discover with land versus sea. So I'm sure I'll be talking about that in the coming weeks. Now, one thing I've been playing with, and I know you tried out the demo yes. of, is the Guild of Dungeoneering Ultimate Edition. This is a new edition of the game that puts together all the content mm -hmm. into one place. We did receive a Steam code for this game from the publisher, and I've been trying it out for a week or so now. I've got, uh, yeah, I've only actually got about four or so hours of play, but it's a nice game where you can sit down, play it for a little while, and come back to it. Mm -hmm. Now, this game brings an old school black and white pencil mapping aesthetic to modern deck building roguelite, rogue and roguelike. And it does a few really interesting things while staying very minimalist. Mm -hmm. uh, the game itself has been out six years now, wow. but this is the ultimate edition that's new. You're playing as a rather, uh, you're playing as rather replaceable dungeoneers that you're hiring uh, as you yourself aren't silly enough to go down into these dangerous dungeons. You're outfitting your guild hall and giving the hirelings more advantages while they go and collect the golden treasure for you. One of the really fun for a while things about the game is the bard who sings throughout, giving fun pseudo rhyming verses about how you're treating your staff and growing the guild. It's hilarious at first, but after a few plays, I had to turn it off as it got a little bit repetitive. So when I played it, I only got bard songs when I built something new and when I completed a dungeon. Yep. That, was so, it more than that? No, pretty much that's it. Uh, you know, I think uh, when you complete the dungeon, then when you go back to your guild hall and a new, uh, and if, if someone has died, they come back the next turn oh, after. So and I, think I didn't come. get to see people dead. So, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's not painfully annoying. Yeah, I didn't uh, find, I thought when you complained about it, I thought it was going to be more common. Well, it's just, it's just that it, there, there wasn't enough diversity. So yeah. once you've played it a few times, I, I think, for all I know, I've heard it all already, and that and that was, okay. was like I don't want to hear this same song again, even though it's short. Fair. It was still just kind of a bit too much. Fair enough. What I really liked about this game that was very different from anything else I played is that it was kind of program movement. So you just had an adventurer who came in who was just dumb and would immediately start heading towards the biggest treasure they could see. And you probably didn't want that. So your hand play would be to build bits of the dungeon, seed it with monsters and treasure. And I don't know what the, the fountains are, rooms, but there's various room types. And then trying to get your adventurer to go the right way. So he didn't just like rush the boss at the beginning. And I just thought that whole concept was fascinating because you don't control the adventure, but you can change where he goes by building the dungeon different ways. So in a way you're kind of playing the bad guys, but you're not. And I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, although I, I was, I'm not 100% sure because there were a couple of times where I built something because I really wanted him to go a certain way and, and they just didn't. Um, so that was, there was, there's some weirdness about where they are willing to go and where they aren't willing to go that I'm not 100% clear on. Um, but no, it's really interesting. Like the fact that you're building both a, uh, a combat deck 
Yes. And you're building the dungeon, and you're building the Dungeoneers Guild, which yeah, is what gives you a, advantages and, and different types of Dungeoneers to go and delve for mm -hmm. you, uh, is, is a, a nice variety of right. different things to work on all within this one same game. Uh, and really, every dungeon delve only takes a few minutes. It, it, it's like yeah. a 15, maybe 20 minute delve. Uh, and then you can, you know, quit out and, and go go back and play it again. That's the way I've been using it, mm -hmm. uh, which is a nice change because unlike Rogue Book, you know, Rogue Book was taking way too long to play. And yes. that was one of our big complaints is it, it felt like it should have been something we could sit down and play for 15 minutes, but it mm -hmm. ended up taking way longer. Yeah, that was the one thing. Compared to other roguelikes, you fight a lot more battles. Like going back to uh, Slay the Spire and all of those, it's just battle after battle after battle after battle. Whereas this was much more wander around the dungeon, have a few fights to level up, then go do the boss thing and then be done. It was a lot quicker with a lot less work to get to the end, it felt. Like, yeah, although it's interesting because one of, the, one of the sort of decisions you need to make is how many fights you want. Yes. So every time you go into the dungeon, you start with no equipment whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get equipment is to fight bad guys and pick from the selection available after defeating a bad guy. Uh, so you want to try and get a helmet, armor, and an offhand and main hand weapon before you take on that bad guy. Mm -hmm. Unless maybe it's you're only on the first level of the dungeon and you think you can rush through and get to the end there. So again, there's some nice waiting of decisions that, mm -hmm. that have to take place there. Yeah, and I was trying to figure out if there was a reason to just put more monsters and more loot to kind of grind to get more money to improve my guild, and that did seem like a way to do it, though you get so little gold that I don't know if it was worth your time. And that was the part I was having, like, again, I've only played the demo version, so I don't know if your version's different. And I'm like, you know, I have lots of cards. I could build this dungeon almost forever and just keep killing first-level goblins, but is it worth doing this? And I couldn't tell. I was like, I don't know where I am on the fence on this. Yeah, it, it doesn't really seem to be. I mean, there's a chance you can get uh, some cards for the dungeon that places treasure in there, but yeah. actually defeating bad guys, um, it, there's only so much you're going to do. Uh, now, once you have a full set of, of the gear you want, uh, any additional gear you get, you turn into coin. Right. Uh, but again, it's not a lot of coin. Uh, and the problem is, uh, while all the first level expansions for your dungeon, Dungeoneer Guild are only 50 coin, and mm -hmm. pretty much once every successful dungeon delve is going to get you at least 50. Yep. The second level stuff is all 500 gold. And I haven't gotten any <laughs> second tier yeah. stuff yet, because 500 gold is a lot in this game. And to be honest, that's, that's a roguelike thing, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. why people play roguelikes and you keep playing and why you go through, Rogue Book's only three floors, why you go through those same three floors <laughs> over and over again for that little incremental bonus. Yep. And to be honest, that's where I usually start losing interest, so. Yep, nope, fair. Uh, so I, I'm definitely interested in it. I'll be playing it for a little while longer, but we'll see, uh, we'll see how far, how long before it peters out. So what we will do is we'll drop a link to that um, in the show notes for anyone who wants to check it out. Maybe you can grab a quick link and drop it in the chat if anyone wants to see it. Uh, there is a free demo on Steam that uh, is surprisingly um, verbose. Like, like it's not just do the first dungeon. It, you do the first dungeon and it unlocks three more. Yeah. And I, for the amount I've played the game, which isn't as much as Sean, I've still only completed two of those four dungeons. Uh, honestly, the demo is probably good for five or six hours at least. Yeah, that's uh, if, if not it felt like 10 it. hours. So it's a good solid uh, amount of play there. And again, demo's totally free, so it's worth checking out. And once again, that is the Guild of Dungeoneers. Uh, is that Ultimate Edition? Is that where we're at? Now? Ultimate Edition, yes. Yes, Ultimate Edition. All right, well, now, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right, so more vi land versus sea, obviously. Um, I think Tori and Kat are coming over this Friday. I'm not sure if Kat's still in the chat. Um, so we'll get to see how that plays with four players, which uh, is an interesting team-based way to play. I'm also looking really forward to trying it with three players, where you have land, sea, and a cartographer. And basically the cartographer scores for what the other players are doing while still building stuff. That sounds absolutely fa uh, fascinating. Uh, the thing is, we need to play it a couple times before that. 
because you have to use the waypoints, which we haven't tried yet. Like we have, there's no unlocking. I want to say we haven't unlocked it. We just haven't tried it. So I need to get in a game with Deanna ahead of time just to try out the waypoints, which is these like wooden tokens you put on the map that are basically saying, I'm going to complete this next. And if you do, you get some points. And while when you're playing teams, you're not allowed to talk to each other or show each other your tiles. So it's a way to communicate with your partner non-verbally to be like hey complete this or hey i'm gonna complete this or no no don't look over there look at this thing that's almost done or something i don't know i, I we haven't played with waypoints so that's a big one i, I want to play some land versus sea there's a very small chance we'll have that review ready for next week but i'm not positive it might happen uh now that i've unboxed my copy of galaxy trucker uh for people who don't know there is a new printing of galaxy trucker on the way with a significantly reduced price. And as far as I can tell from the unboxing, the exact same quality as the base game, like the original big box version. Uh, there are some minor rule tweaks that all honestly seem like they improved the game. There's no more when you're done scrambling to grab a number one, two, and three that's now automated. It looks like they tweaked the decks a little bit. And then there's um, basic way to play is not a full three. That's like a, a special way to play is play through three runs that's now a campaign based play that adds in these rewards you can earn for having like the most of something or the least so there are some changes from the original but seriously i can't believe how good this looks for the reduced price so i congrats cge on that now deanna refused to play it because she hates the game so i'm going to be playing this one with the kids so we're going to see how the kids like it and then again maybe i can get that played on friday as well and i have a feeling the in-laws uh, i think this is one that holly would enjoy as well so now, this version does only play four players, so we'll see what we can do. So we're good there. Um, the other thing is we had originally planned on playing Forest of No Return and then decided to switch over to this other adventure because it was date night and we didn't want the gore and blood of Forest of No Return. So getting back to not what we expected when we pulled out Veil Dancer, I still want to finish Forest of No Return. So I don't know if that's going to fit in, uh, especially if people are coming over Friday, maybe Saturday night, D and I can sit down and finish that. I do want to uh, finish off Forest and return and review that and hopefully have a better experience than we did with the Veil Dancer. Again, great mechanics, like really neat stuff they did. And I'm like, I want Sean to come down and play it and we'll just mechanically play through it. Like, we'll just <laughs> skip the story. We'll be like, all right, we're going to have the first fight and do this thing and now we're going to have the second fight. Except for the fact that now that I know what happens, it's I'm going to play it very differently. So this one does have a definite spoiler. Like, it, as usual, it has four different difficulty levels. But I have a feeling playing on the next difficulty level is going to be very different because I know how the second part of the adventure compares to the first. Fair. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. So first off, just a public shout out to Tuari. Thank you for the subscription here on Twitch. Always appreciate it. As for patrons, I want to welcome Dukas, our newest hotel guest. Thank you very much for your support. Joe Swick. Thanks, Joe. Evil John, Mr. Carney, who's having way too many computer problems lately. And Donna. Thank you, Donna. And finally, Courtney Jackson. We have got to get together and play online again. Just not meshing up. Just won't, can't seem to get us all together to play a game together. We owe you games. We need to play them. Face face. Sean's got to play with Shy Pluto. We got to put that up on Tabletop Simulator. But thank you, Courtney. Your support is greatly appreciated, even if we can't seem to get those schedules to mesh together. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to slam that portcullis. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find your podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. That's our podcast, not your podcast. Though we can probably find your podcast on the podcatcher of choice too. If you do have a podcast, you know what? Give me a shout out. Let me know. I'll throw it in our uh, master list of tabletop gaming podcasts over on the blog. Something that everyone should go check out. Did you know that? You go to tabletopbellhop.com. I got like a list of uh, YouTube channels and I got a list of tabletop crafters, a list of people you can watch on Twitch that aren't us, but just don't go see them until our show's done. Some content we don't talk about that often. Now, if you do dig the content we're providing and want to support our continued efforts, as well as our ability to keep improving the show through the use of software and technology, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop.
Now, before we go, I do want to shout out one more time to our sponsor, Crowd Games. Be sure to check out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter. There's not a lot of time left in that one. And I got to say, it looks good. Just last week, we shared some details on the game and how it works. I do strongly recommend checking out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter by Crowd Games. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the Pendo Suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, game on. on.